Praise God. Hmm. Hallelujah. Fathers of faith. You know, the thing about Father's Day and Mother's Day, somehow, subtly, without intending to, we paint this picture of those who should be perfect. I remember just a few weeks ago talking about Mother's Day and saying, you know what? There's no perfect mother. There's no perfect father. There's no perfect preacher. There's no perfect church. And if there was, when this preacher came, it would have ended. You understand what I'm saying? None of us are without sin. That's what the scripture says. Isaiah said it in the Old Testament. Romans says it in the New Testament. That we were all conceived in sin. Not referring to the action, but referring to the bloodline through Adam and Eve. That we were born into sin. And only the miraculous act of the Lord Jesus Christ gets us out of it. What do you want? A father who prepares you for life? Or a father who prepares you for eternity? Dads, I, obviously we're preaching to you today. But we're preaching to moms. Preaching to singles. We're preaching to those who are married and have no children. Uh, this is a message for all of us about what it means to be faith-filled. What's a dad to be? What's a dad to do? And by the way, those are separate. You probably won't do until you be. I don't know, I heard a preacher say once, remember the old rock songs? do be do be do <laughs> are we supposed to be or are we supposed to do? We're supposed to do both. And I think doing comes out of being. Are we people of faith? Are we men and women of faith? Are we fathers of faith? We discover through the life of Abraham that you can be a father of faith and still be imperfect. Because he was. Aren't you glad God gave us an example that's perfect? Do you know your Heavenly Father is perfect? You never have to doubt His love. You never have to doubt His character. You never have to doubt His ability to change you, to prepare you and equip you for eternity. Luke eleven thirteen says, So if we, being sinful people, He just lays it out there. I began with that. So if we, being sinful people, Know how to give good gifts as fathers, as mothers, as whatever, children of God. If we know how to give good gifts to our children, hmm, how much more? You want a fun Bible study, look up the words together in the Bible much more. There are a whole series of Bible verses that talk about much more, and they're all delightful. They are a comparison with man and with God. If we can give good gifts, how much more can our Heavenly Father give good gifts? He says He'll give you the Holy Spirit. He gave us Christ, and He gives us the Holy Spirit. We'll talk in a second about what that means. God is the best example of a father of faith. Romans 8.32, one of my favorite verses. I quote it to you all the time. You may be sick of hearing it, but don't be, because it's your life. It's the flow of God's vision within you. Since God the Father, that's who it refers to, did not spare even His only begotten Son. Romans, or excuse me, uh, John 3.16. He did not spare even His own Son. How many of us would give up our sons? I'm looking at two strapping sons and a dad who's a sheriff who said, not on your life. I protect them. I keep them. You know, I surround them with my love and my protection. God the Father knew the only gift that would save us was to give us his only begotten son. And he did not spare him. But he gave him up for us all. 
Don't ever wonder, are you in the kingdom? You're in the kingdom. If you received Christ, you're in the kingdom. It's that simple. No big theological issue. If you received Christ by faith, you belong to God the Father. But he gave him up for us all. And then that question I love. It's a rhetorical question. Look, at if he gave you his son, the most important thing he ever had, would he not also give you all things freely, whatever you need? Whatever you need. We won't take the time because it might be too embarrassing, but without raising your hand, without saying anything, what do you need? If you sat down and you were honest with God, what do you need? What do you want? What does your heart ache for? What do you need God to do? Do you believe He can do it? Oh yeah, of course we believe He can do it. Easy to say. Not so easy to believe and live out. He will give you all things freely, everything else freely. And because God understands that He's perfect and He's God and He's eternal, and we have a hard time following that kind of example, though we could and we should, He decided to give us a second human example. The human example, second best human example, is Abraham. Or Father Abraham. As the word refers to him, that's what it calls him, Father Abraham. If you want to know about Father Abraham, you can read it in one short chapter in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 25. Awesome about Father Abraham. So Abraham is the spiritual father of all who have believed in God. How many of you do raise your hands? How many of you believe in God? All right. Abraham's your father. Some of you may have said, God, my human father isn't all that I wanted him to be. He's not a strong spiritual man. He's not this, he's not that. you got a spiritual father. His name is Abraham. Just remember, he wasn't perfect either. He's the example we probably need to look at in terms of, wow. Spiritual fathers sometimes struggle. Do I know any spiritual fathers out there who struggle? I'm raising my hand. Come on. (laughs) I'm the only one? Oh, there's a couple out there. Okay. All right. So Abraham is the spiritual father of all those who believe or have faith in God. And what does that mean? Very simply, it means that we trust or we believe in God's goodness. How often do you think, well, God's given me a hard time. Do you believe in God's goodness? God's allowing me to go through this really rotten time. Do you believe in his goodness? Because he intends to bring good out of it. And he will. And when he's done, it'll be awesome. Far more than you could have ever thought. To trust and to believe in God's goodness. And that God has a plan. And it's a good one. You ever sometimes feel like you're just kind of bouncing off walls in life and circumstances come and they hit you and you don't know what you're doing and you don't know where you're going and the doctors don't know and you don't know and you just, where am I? And by the way, God, where are you? God has a plan and it's a good one. I love that imagery that I heard preachers share for years and years and years about the the tapestry in heaven and we sit on this side of the earth and we look up to the tapestry that's our lives and we see dark threads and knots and and it's ugly and there's no form and it doesn't make sense and we ask why God what is all this And someday he's going to take us to heaven and we're going to see the tapestry from the other side. And we're going to see the bright colors weaved in beside the dark colors of tough times. And you're going to say, that's my life? That was beautiful. God, you did have a good plan. You do know what you're doing, Father. Thank you, Lord. I do believe in your 
goodness and in your good or great plan. Father Abraham, just quickly, we're going to run through part of his life. Kind of an overview. He didn't start out as Abraham or Ibrahim, as you sometimes hear it today. He started out as Abram. As a child, he was named Abram by Terah, his father. You know what Abram means? It's up there. This man is destined to be a father who is exalted. How many of you would take that one? Say, yeah, Lord, thank you. Ah, boy, name me the father that's exalted. Whoo! Eat it up. Love it. All right. Son of an idol maker. The greatest man of faith had a spurious beginning at best. His parents weren't all that stable. His dad made idols, false idols, that led people away from God. Yet he became a great man of faith. It's not about your mom and your dad. It's about your heavenly father. Your heavenly father. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. God said to Abraham, now he's 75 years, excuse me, Abram, 75 years old. What does Abram mean? Father who will be exalted. How many kids did he have at 75? Zip. Nada. Nyet. None. You ever feel like God has embarrassed you? He's given you promises. He's set you on a course and you're excited about that. And you step out in it and all of a sudden the bottom drops out and you realize, ooh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. I'm 75 and I'm supposed to be the father who is exalted. I don't even meet the first qualification. Father. You ever feel like that's you? I don't make the, meet the first qualification. Not necessarily as father, but whatever you feel spirituality is. And you're not there. Something in your life isn't what you want it to be. And you think, God, why am I going through this? What's the good plan? Where is it? And God said to Abram, 75 years of age, his father had just died, leave Haran, which is his hometown. Leave Haran and go to a place called Canaan. Any of you know where, what Canaan is? What's the other name for Canaan? Three words. The promised land. Yes, Barb, thank you. She's a promised land. Canaan is a promised land. God promised Israel, excuse me, God promised Abram that he would father many children. And listen to this. 75 years of age. Not the bear. You know, in October I'll be 65. I don't want any children, Lord. I have enough. 75, and he said, my body's dead. And so is my wife Sarai's. We, you know, wow. Leave Haran, and I will make of you a father of a great nation, which would be Israel, which was non-existent when he said that to him. So you think, okay, God, you can do a miracle. 75 years of age, you're going to give me a child. Great, God, where's the child? They even tried doing it backwards. Some of you know that story, and that's not what God wants you to do. That's the flesh deciding, well, I'll fix this. <laughs> when you look at the way God isn't doing what you think he ought to do, the flesh in us is tempted to say, well, I know what to do with that. I can fix this. And what he did was to bear a child by the name of Ishmael. Ishmael, as many of you know, became the father of all the Arabs. What we have today in the crisis in the Middle East stems directly from a decision that Abraham and Sarah made in their bedroom. And the world has lived with that crisis ever since. And the ending of this world will be around that crisis. Be careful of the decisions you make in the flesh. They not only will influence you, but the world around you. Wow. Live in the Spirit. Ask God for the wisdom. He said, I'll make you a great nation. 75, no children. And just one verse back in Genesis 11.30 says what? 
And Sarai, we'll get to her name in a minute, was unable to get pregnant and had no children at 75. You know, when God gives you promise sometimes, and I've, I've learned over the years, sometimes out of embarrassment to not, when God gives you something, do what Mary did. Treasure it in your heart. Don't go broadcast it. Who do we know in the Old Testament went and broadcasted it and got in trouble? Joseph. He said, aha, all of your sheaves are going to bow down to my sheaves. Stalks of corn. And God's going to bless me. And brothers, God's not going to bless you. You're going to worship me. Hold on to what God says to you. Look for God to speak to you because he will. But that's not the time to arrogantly broadcast it to everybody else. Hold it within, treasure it, and believe God for the miracle. Sarai. I got two of the sweetest granddaughters. They are awesome. We were at the town park. And I never saw a girl have more fun. Zoe's there in the middle of the creek, splashing and having fun, wet from head to toe, and just having the time of her life. All girls want to be a princess. Their favorite play is to put on princess clothes, and they got princess clothes all over the place. I think Mommy's even thrown out some princess clothes because they don't fit anymore. Every little girl wants to be a princess. What did God name Abram's wife, Sarah? Princess. Wow. Every one of you are a princess from God. You say, then why is my life so messed up? Be patient. God will get you there. He's not done yet. Hang on to your faith. But Sarai, whose name meant princess, and by the way, both Sarah and Sarai mean the same thing in the original Hebrew, princess, was unable to get pregnant and therefore had no children at 65 years of age, 75 years of age. So, later on in the chapter, 75 years of age, God promises again. This is the second time God says to Abram, I will give this land, Canaan, to all of your descendants. You and I would say, oh, that's wonderful, God, except Abraham said, Abram said, I don't have any descendants. I don't have any children. God, you're killing me here. <laughs> you ever feel that way? God, I see promise after promise after promise, and it's not coming true. And God, am I missing you? I don't think you're cruel, God, to promise something you don't tend to give, but God, you keep promising and prophesying over me, and it's not coming true. 75 years of age. 13, Genesis 13, next chapter. Again, the same thing. I'm giving you this land as far as you can see. He literally said to Moses, or to, uh, excuse me, Abraham, go up in the mountain, look out, see as far as you can see, all that's going to be yours. And furthermore, I'll pass it down to your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. Uh, God, this one problem with this promise. I don't have any children. I mean, the first time you think, maybe I missed God. And so you just shove the promise away. But then the promise keeps returning. The prophecy keeps returning. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And hang on, because you'd, you'd think, boy, I'm glad I'm not Abram. Because it gets boring after a while. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of age, 70 years of age, 75 years of age, no children. The promises keep coming. Two chapters later, same thing. Gives him the Abrahamic covenant. Sounds profound. What he basically said to him is this. If you can count the stars in the sky, that's how many children you'll have. If you can count the sands of the sea, that's how many children you'll have. And he's got none. You and I would look at that and say, God, you're cruel. That hurts God. My whole life has been a promise and it's not happening. And I don't like this God and I'm embarrassed. Hmm. Verse 15, or chapter 15. 
after God gave the Abrahamic covenant, what does it say? Abraham what? Abraham is called the father of faith. It's, and, and I'm not reading you the other passages for lack of time, but there are passages where God says to, excuse me, Abraham, Abram says to God, God, what are you doing? There's no children here. Stop saying that. I'm confused. I'm disoriented. I don't understand what's happening, God. I'm not where I thought I would be and I'm not where I wanted to be. But in his heart of hearts, and this is when you become a father, a mother, a wife, of a, a child of faith. He says, God, I don't see anything you promised, but I believe you. Anyway, in spite of what I don't see, no kids, I believe you. The interesting thing is there were three or four times where it says that Abraham stopped and built an altar and praised God. In the midst of your prophecies and your promises from God not being fulfilled, Follow the principles of Abraham, which is to stop in the middle of your darkness, build an altar in your heart and say, God, well, all that I see is darkness, but I will praise you anyway. I will praise you anyway. I don't understand what's happening. I hear your word, but I don't see any of it. And the darkness is just penetrating but God, I choose to believe you. And God responded very simply. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Because he did so many things? No. It wasn't about obedience. It was one thing God wanted from him. Faith. He wanted Abraham or Abram to say, God, I'll believe you no matter what. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. That's powerful. Sooner or later, all of us get trapped in, a, in the decision, or the, excuse me, the statements that we make that we look at and say, you know, well, that wasn't really true. The Bible just calls it a lie. Didn't intend to, and after all, it was just a little one. God is not a man that he should lie. When God tells you he's going to do something, you rest in that. He's going to do it. Father Abraham, chapter 17, two chapters later. God promises again. This is several years later now. God promises again. This time he changes Abram's name to Abraham. Which means not that you're just the father of one nation, and that nation being Israel. Now, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. A multitude of nations. No children. Do you ever look at what God's doing in your life and say, God, I don't understand. The circumstances are so strained and strange and dark. And then, God says in Genesis 17, 1 through 21, He looks at Sarah and He says, Sarah... You will be the mother of a multitude of nations. She's barren. Her body is old. She cannot produce children. And he says to her, you will be the mother of a multitude of nations. Stop, God. <laughs> 99 years old now. Wow. Wow. Our friend here in the town, turning 100. Imagine her bearing a child at 100 years old of age. Wow. 99 years old. They still had no children. And God appears to them and says, you know what? Get ready. It's time. Now, three times he's built an altar and said, God, I'm ready. I believe you. I don't see it. That's what faith is. You don't see by your eyesight, what's happening, you see by faith what God has spoken into your spirit and into your heart. That's what faith is. 
And he says to her, actually he says to Abram, Abraham now, father of multitude of many nations, he says, get ready, because a year from now you're going to have a child. How many of you would have said, God, go away? <laughs> I've heard these promises for a lifetime. I don't want to hear them anymore. Fess up. <laughs> And she's standing, the scripture says, in the tent around the corner of the flap where she's out of clear sight of God who's speaking to Abram, Abraham. And God says, by the way, Sarah, I heard that. You laughed. And it, was a, it wasn't a laugh of joy. It was a laugh of, you've got to be kidding me, God. I've heard this so many times and it didn't come true. God says, what I want you to do, Sarah, who's hiding around the corner, I want you to name the son when he comes. God said it's going to be a son. It's going to be a year from now. And you'll name him Isaac, which in the Hebrew means laughter. You might say, how cruel that now every time I call my child, I've got to remember that I didn't believe God and I snickered. Do you know what? I think God meant something else. I think, how many of you have ever had children? Fess up, men and women. Okay. Boy, do they bring laughter. I stood there looking at my granddaughter, running up and down, walking up and down. I won't tell you, you know, some of what was going on was... I took a bunch of pictures of her, and for some reason I have three of them in that position. I don't know why. I've deleted them all, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I said to her, do you want me to take you home and you can go? No, that's okay. <laughs> and I just started to laugh. It's like I remember being lost in, pray, in play, having so much fun. You as a parent get lost in the joy that your children are having and your grandchildren are having. And I was lost, and I laughed there were many years to come in Sarah's and Abraham's life where they would laugh over the joy. They would look at the miracle of Isaac. I love what, by the way, God always keeps his promises. How did they do that? You want to be a person of faith? They had much fear, much frustration. You say, well, wait a minute, this is Abraham. I know we're going to get to Romans and what God said. But I also know that their experience of faith at times brought them fear and frustration. Not that the faith brought that, but that their human experience in the middle of trying to believe brought that. And even some failure along the way. Moral and otherwise. But ultimately, God said. Doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter how you evaluate what Abraham was doing. Matters what God says. <laughs> and God says he's a man of great faith. They repeatedly built altars and praised God for what he was going to do. Very quickly, Romans 4.17 in the NIV. Abraham is our, he's your father. You want a father of great faith? Abraham's his name. He's your father. And Abraham did what? God said that, I didn't. And Abraham believed in the God who gives life from death. Each of us, I think, have situations in our lives where we look at it and it's dead. You had any prayers that you've been praying over and it's dead. I think God intentionally does that. You say, why? Is he mean? No. He wants you to understand that when he changes the situation... It wasn't your power that did it. It was His. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. He believed in the God who gives life to the dead. And, and this is probably the most important verse I'm going to share with you. And He believed in the God who speaks things into being or into existence. Those things that were not even as though they were. Let me explain that to you. That's the character of God. It's creativity. Genesis before, you know, the whole creation. 
God looks into the darkness and there's no universe there. And according to Hebrews chapter 1, God speaks the worlds into existence. God simply says, you know, in that darkness out there, there ought to be some planets. And I know exactly where I want to put them and God mathematically calculated exactly where they should go and why. And God spoke into the darkness and created a universe. You're his children. And God says to you, speak into the darkness. Look at the mess in your life. Been there, done that, lived there some days. Look at the mess in your life and speak into that darkness. And speak with faith and speak creatively what you hear me telling you to speak. Listen for God to speak to you. He'll speak to you. I remember as a Baptist growing up and even graduated from Bible college, I'd been through seven years of pastoring here and I was probably four years into pastoring in Orchard Park when it somehow got through to me that God wanted to speak to us today. I had degrees in theology. Didn't know God wanted to speak today. I don't know, you had a, a, a graduate degree in, from Princeton in theology. Did you know then that God wanted to speak to you? I didn't when I graduated. You probably knew that. You were smarter than I. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know that God wanted to walk me through every day and speak to me every moment of the day and walk through it with me and guide me and convict me and stop me and start me and love on me throughout each and every day. I didn't know that. God says that Abraham was a great man of faith because he could look into the darkness of his own body and his wife's and he could speak faith. God, I'm receiving that you're going to give us a child. And not only one, but that what you said, God, is that my children will be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. And he spoke it without a child. Without a child. Wow. Speak those things into existence. Next verse, even when there was, what? No reason for hope. I love that verse. Even when there was no reason for hope, you look at the situation logically and you say, nah, nope, not going to happen. Definitely not going to happen. Abraham kept hoping and believing that he would become the father of many nations. Verse 20, Abraham, this is God speaking, and I know the Old Testament scriptures, and this is the grace of God that said this, because there were many times when Abraham went to God and said, what are you doing? And yet God says graciously, the reason I share this is because God will be gracious with you. Did you stumble? Did you fall in your faith? It's okay. God's got it covered. It's all right. Let go of it. God says in Romans 4.20 about Abraham, Abraham never wavered in his faith. He's like the father that says, no, he didn't ever, didn't ever waver. The grace of God towards Abraham is amazing and towards you when you operate in faith and I never wavered from believing God's promise. In fact, it says, his faith grew stronger, and in this he glorified, or he gave glory to God. Magnifying is the word for the day. Magnifying God. Abraham glorified and magnified God because he spoke into the darkness of his situation and said, it will be, it will happen. Closing with this. These are questions for us. I don't want you to answer them except in your heart and make them a resolution. A resolution to faith that you will be a woman of faith, a man of faith, a child of faith. Make this your statement. Do we, like Abraham, rest in the God who holds our future? Do you rest? Or are you, oh, what am I going to do? I don't this is what a plan. I, oh, God, twist this, change that. I didn't see this coming, God. Rest. 
Rest in the God who holds your future. Whether it was medically or whether it was relationally or whether it was whatever, financially, whatever it was, that you look at the future and it looks black. God says, rest in me. Secondly, build altars of worship in your heart and praise God. Satan, I will not give in to defeat. I will not give in to depression. I will not. I will stand in faith in the middle of the blackness of what I'm going through. And I will praise you in advance for what you will do someday for me in the future, whether it's 10 minutes, 10 years, or 100 years. Speak in faith into the darkness of your present life expecting God to create the life he prophesied out of dead circumstances and finally there's a passage in the Old Testament that says quit you like men it's the King James it means stand up and be a man men stand up and be a man be a man of faith don't give in to, def to defeat, to fear, to depression. Don't give in to it. Fight it. Will you struggle? Yep. Some days will you lose the struggle? Probably. If you're like me. You know. But you're going to make it because you're a man and a woman and a child of faith. Act like fathers of faith, mothers of faith. When you stumble, it's okay. I love what God says to Abraham. So precious. With that we're done. He says, oh yeah, he never stumbled. God forgives our stumbling. Sets us back on track. Gives us a pat on the head. Sometimes a... <laughs> Sometimes he has to do that for me. You know, a little kick in the rear. Get you moving. And say... You know, child of faith, go for it. Believe in me. Trust me. Speak into that darkness and receive. you got to be clear. And we're not talking about speaking what you see. i got all kinds of ideas as to what I think God ought to do. He's not impressed. I don't understand that. God's not impressed with my rationale at all. He says, I want you to be still, Gordon. And I want you to listen to me. And what you hear me tell you in the stillness of your heart, then go speak. That's what you're to speak. What I tell you to speak, not what you want to happen. 